Good morning, Greg, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say what a great pleasure and privilege it is to represent Christie's here, for Christie to be invited by the Crown Prince in his office uh, to Bahrain, the centre of the pearling industry for thousands of years, as you all know. Uh, Chris has been selling jewellery not for thousands of years, but for a long time. And so we feel very, very privileged to be aligned with Bahrain and the centre of the world. Uh, great. So thank you very much to, to Dana as well and to Ken in particular for all his huge support and to A to Z and uh, Dr. Rahman Al Zayani for this wonderful display of the crowds at the Four Seasons Hotel, which I hope you've all seen and if you haven't, I hope you'll be going there immediately after we finish here. So thank you all very much. Could we dim the lights, please? The pearls were and and still are, the oldest gemstone known to man. Ancient civilizations would have found pearls as they foraged, foraged for food. And, of course, the natural beauty would have sprung out of the pearl and would have become an item of decoration. Um, pearls predate probably any other gemstone, because all other gemstones would have to have been found, uh, recognized as something of value, and um, then they would have to have the ability to cut them. So gemstones, diamonds, rubies, sapphires, etc., came on the scene very, very much later. In fact, diamonds were uh, most notoriously difficult to cut because of their, their extreme hardness. And actually, it wasn't until the end of the 20th century that they found a method of cutting diamonds. Um, and up until that point, they were mostly used as cutting tools themselves. So you can see the pearls do predate all of the notes by thousands and thousands of years. It's also interesting that the common belief with pearls was that the way a pearl was formed in a shell, it's rather romantic, you might not believe what I say, but I promise you this was the case all around the world, um, was that the, the oysters would, at night time, rise to the surface of the water by the light of the moon, and the oysters would open, and a, a drop of dew, dew would fall from the sky into the shell, and that would create a pearl. Of course, we don't believe this now, but actually this was a common belief all around the world up until at least 1900, as late as that. And there were slight variations on the story. In, in, in China, for example, they believed that it was dragons in the sky that dropped this drop of water into the pearl. Um, I think Ken will probably tell you something different about how a pearl is formed. Um, I'm sure the laboratories have moved on since then. Um, as I say, Christie's is not as old as the pearl trade, but we began in 1766. And James Christie was a Scottish sailor who came down from Scotland. And um, he, uh, he started his own auction house in 1766 in London. He was very entrepreneurial and he spread out his network in Europe. And he had, he had um, a network of, of dealer artists that were collecting works of art for him and sending them back to London. He also um, set up his his, um, his gallery in the middle of town in Covent Garden and he had, he had the only space for exhibiting paintings in London. Um, sorry, do we, can everyone hear me because this microphone I think is not working very well? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Shall I keep it or shall I throw it? Keep it. Throw it. Throw it. Throw it, keep it, who throw it? So long as you're happy. So, um, the interesting thing about James Christie's Salem was that it was the first public space where people could see paintings. And in 1766, there were no museums exhibiting any works of art. The British Museum had just opened a few years earlier, but you could only go to the British Museum if you booked a <coughs> ticket two weeks in advance, and they only had manuscripts and coins and some Islamic. It's very small. So, one has to understand that in, in 1766, this was a real novelty for the common person to go somewhere and, and look at paintings. So his auction house was packed full of people. And um, you can see here a scene from 
those days. It was, it was a meeting place as well. People used to come, exchange ideas, and buy paintings. And it was quite noisy, rather, actually. James Christie, I want to talk about two very important points that put the firm on the map thoroughly. And Horton Hall um, belonged to the first Prime Minister of, of, of England, um, who was um, called uh, Robert Walpole. And he was Prime Minister from 1721 to 1742, and he, bought this, he built this magnificent house. But in it, he had extraordinary paintings, Rembrandt's Rubens van Dyck. And unfortunately, when he died, his family were unable to maintain the house, and they ran out of money. And in 1779, they went to James Christie, and they asked him to sell the paintings. Christie sold them by private treaty to Catherine the Great, and 204 paintings were sold to Catherine the Great, and they're now in the Hermitage. That was a very significant moment and really put Christie's as a company on the map in a very big way. The second thing that happened that was really important in the, in the life of James Christie <coughs> was the unfortunate demise of Madame du Barry. Madame du Barry was the uh, mistress of King Louis XV of France. And she unfortunately had a robbery and a lot of her jewelry was stolen. And this was at the time of the, of the French Revolution. And she did a very unfortunate thing. She decided not to go to the police, but to advertise in the newspapers that her jewelry had been stolen. And she advertised all these extraordinary jewels with some sort of pride, I think, that she owned incredible pearls, incredible jewelry. Um, unfortunately, the French people then thought that she was too much of a royalist and too wealthy, and they didn't like her. She, 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 she went to England to try and find her jewelry. She heard that some of her jewels were in London. She recovered some of them. She decided to go back to France to collect the rest of her jewels. Her lawyer said, don't do it, it's dangerous. She went, and they caught her and they chopped her head off. So, in 1795, um, uh, James Christie was asked to sell her jewelry. And her jewelry was really jewels from the, the French crown jewels, mostly gifts given by the king. And that was hugely significant. Um, and put, again, James Christie's auction house firmly on the map. And really from those days up until the 1930s, I would say, there was no real competition in terms of where works of art were sold at auction. They all came to Christie's. And that's relevant because all the pearls came to Christie's. And as you'll see, um, we are very lucky to have dealt with some extraordinary pearls. The ones I'm going to talk about today, although some of them are very old, Virtually all of them have been sold during the time that I've been there. So I'm extremely lucky to have had that opportunity to have handled these pearls. These are the extraordinary Mancini pearls. Um, they weigh approximately 200 grains each. And in terms of them being a, a very fine, large, matched pair, they are probably the biggest and best matched ever recorded. Um, once you get to this kind of size, it's extremely difficult to match them. They belonged originally to Charles I of England. Uh, he was in fact Charles I of England, Scotland and Ireland. And he was a very arrogant fellow. You can probably see that in his expression, the way he's standing here in this painting. He believed in the royalist absolute rule of power. And he didn't really like his own government. Um, he kept replacing his government, sacking his government and he kept imposing taxes. A lot of those taxes he imposed was to buy works of art and jewellery. And uh, some of those works of art remain today, but most of his collection after his death, unfortunately, was disposed of by Cromwell. Um, so he actually fought against his own government, and he started two civil wars against his own government, both of which he lost, rather stupidly, um, and so he chopped his head off. And you can see a monument in Whitehall near um, Downing Street where, in fact, the, the deed was done. Um, and uh, his, he was married to Henrietta, Queen Henrietta, um, who was a French uh, cousin of, uh, of Louis the Fifteenth, Louis the Fourteenth, excuse me. And so when, just before his beheading, um, she went back to France. She was terrified. She took lots of the, of the, I would say, English crown jewels with her, including these extraordinary natural pearls. 
and she sold them to, to Louis XIV in order to, to make ends meet. Um, and then Louis XIV passed them on to his mistress. His mistress was a niece of the Prime Minister, uh, 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 Mazarin. And so they, they changed hands to Maria Mancini, and, that, and that's the name which stuck with Mancini pearls. So we sold these pearls first of all in 1969, and they made $80,000, and then they came back to Christie's in 1979, and we sold them for $253,000. Today they would, of course, be considerably more. Um, this is King Louis, and on the, on the right is Maria Mancini. This wonderful tiara um, originally was in the Russian crown jewels. It consists of 25 large pearls, and the central pearl, this plump pearl, um, weighs uh, approximately, <clears throat> approximately 168 grains, so it's a substantial pearl. It was owned by and worn by many of the empresses of, of, of Russia, including, including Maria Fedro Fedrova, the mother of Nicholas II. However, during the Russian Revolution in 1918, all of these items were all uh, taken and the Russian crown jewels were in fact pretty much broken up. Um, this is a, a rather blurred picture, I'm sorry, but uh, I think Andrew might actually have a better one in his talk because he touches on this as well. Um, but the, the, the Russian crown jewels, and you see actually here above me this little detail, shows this particular tiara. The Russian crown jewels after the revolution were, were divided into three groups. Um, one group of jewels were kept, they were thought to be of historic importance to the country, um, and another group was actually broken up into gemstones and sold off as gemstones, and a third group that were, that were kept, not broken up, but sold at auction. They were sold through Christie's in 1929. Um, 114 <coughs> including pieces, including this particular tiara. Um, just as an aside, um, I had a very nice experience. In 1990, I was invited by the Russian government to go and look at the crown jewels. And, of course, we're just coming out of the Cold War. I went to Moscow. Moscow was a strange place in those days. Uh, there were no shops, really, not many. Very few restaurants, in fact, not much food. I took some food with me. Um, but I had the great honor of being invited to go to the Kremlin. And they locked the doors, and they had armed guards with Kalashnikovs outside. And I was left in there with the curator for two days. And we opened simple locks on flimsy doors, and we took out of the showcases all of Catherine the Great's jewels. And we sat there discussing the merits of each. And really what they wanted to know was how important was this collection in terms of uh, public collections of jewelry all around the world. Um, so they were needing to be informed really about what they had. For me, absolutely a fascinating time. And then uh, this tiara was then uh, sold at Christie's um, after the, after the sale, first sale of 1929. Um, it was bought by the Duchess of Marlborough, and she bought it back and sold it in 1978. So with us, we sold them and the buyer in 1978 was anonymous. However, I came across it in the valuation that I was doing, and this, I'm afraid, slightly blurred image, uh, is me with some rubber gloves on, holding up the tiara, and at the top left there, there's a funny sort of blur, even more blurred section, and that's actually a piece of sellotape that's holding on, holding a, a loose diamond and there were one or two diamonds missing. And I was in the Philippines doing the valuation of Imelda Marcus's jewels. Some 4,000 pieces, I was there with two, two colleagues for four days. And the jewels were in a safe, and the safe is, uh, has four keys to open that safe. And it, you need four different branches of the government to come together and to agree to be there with their keys to open it. So this is an event that doesn't happen very often. Um, Christie's have been following those Marcos jewels for some 40 years, 
trying to get them to sail. And I've been very involved in that back and forth to the Philippines, but this was the very first time in 2015 that I had the opportunity to see everything. Um, and I was looking over um, at the boxes that they were unpacking, and I could see a cake box. And a, it was a squashed cake box. It looked like somebody had sat on it. And there was a piece of this tiara sticking out the side. And from a distance, I knew what it was. <laughs> I knew it was the Russian Crown Jewels, incredibly important tiara. Um, so I have to tell you that I salvaged it, in a sense, and I put it into a Tupperware box with tissue paper and labelled it and put some tape around it, hoping that it would be preserved wherever it's now kept. Um, so that was a very thrilling moment, so now, now we know where, where, it, where it actually is. These wonderful pearls are quite possibly the most valuable pearls in the world, or I should say two of the remaining rows of what originally was a seven row necklace. These belong to the Maharaja of Baroda, and the state of Baroda was set up in 1726, and it was one of the richest um, Indian states that there was. And of course, because of that, a lot of the pearl traders would, would stop off at Baroda and trade pearls, sell pearls to the Maharaja. So over generations, this necklace grew and grew and grew until it, oh, this is a detail just to show you um, the beautiful <coughs> luster as you can see. And this, the larger one here that's more in focus in the, in the picture, has this typical sort of like beaten format on the skin, like a beaten copper pan. Um, which you quite often see with natural pearl, <coughs> pearls. <coughs> Excuse me. But these were, as you can see, particularly large pearls. Um, this one I'm pointing out was 110 grains. Um, and here is, on the left, the Maharaja of Broda wearing the original seven strands, and the Mahar Mahari Maharani Sita Devi wearing three of those strands. Um, we sold this necklace, it came to us in 2006, and uh, we sold it for $7 million, and at the time it was a world record price for any pearl necklace. The necklace, has, unfortunately, as you see, has had been broken up, but these two strands that we sold that I showed you earlier on were the largest of the pearls that came from the original seven strands. And the Maharani, uh, Sita Devi, who was the second wife, was a very notable figure in Europe. She used to wear all these jewels after the Maharaja's death in 1969. She went on to work to wear a lot of these flamboyant jewels and go to lots of uh, jet set parties throughout the whole of Europe. Um, she, she finally died in 1989. This is probably, I would think, my favorite pearl of all time. Um, and it's the Peregrino pearl. The pearl weighs 203.84 grains. It's a perfectly formed, drop-shaped pearl, and I will show you details, details of it in a moment. Um, but it was found off the coast of Panama in 1579 in a very small shell that was thought to be too small to hold anything of any relevance. And it, was then, it then went to, to Spain, and it went to uh, Seville, where they have what's called the Casa de las Indias, to go on exhibition there, where everything that came from the New Worlds were, were recorded, and it was exhibited there as the largest pearl in the world. Finally, it was sold to Philip II of Spain in 1582. He gave it to his daughter as a gift, and then changed his mind and took it back from her, because he decided that this pearl was far too important to leave the Spanish crown. And by giving it to his daughter, who would then probably marry a royal from another European country, the, the pearl would then leave Spain. So he, he had a change of heart and took it back. Uh, history doesn't relate how sad she was or whether she cared or whatever, but she, it, it then became part of the Spanish crown jewels for 230 years, and it passed from down through eight kings of Spain. Um, the queens were allowed to wear this pearl, the peregrine pearl, and what I'm showing you here just two of the portrait paintings in the Prado Museum uh, with Queen Elizabeth of France wearing it on the left. Um, you have to take my word for it that she's wearing it. It's kind of small in the image here. 
but I've seen the paintings in the Prado and I can uh, vouch for that. And also on the right hand side, Queen Margaret of Austria uh, wearing it. So they all had a chance to wear this exceptional pearl. Um, the pearl, sadly, was taken out of Spain um, in 1808 by Joseph Bonaparte, um, who was, who were, the French were ruling in Spain at the time, but they were driven out of Spain and he eventually fled to Mexico, taking various things with him, including the Peregrine Pearl. It then passed to Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, who brought it to England and sold it eventually to the Duke of Abercorn. Um, and he was raising money for his political efforts in France and sold the pearl. It remained in the Abercorn family for nearly 50 years, and in the early part of the 20th century, they offered it back to the Spanish crown. Um, however, King Alfonso XIII didn't buy it because it was offered at a price that was really rather ridiculous. Plus, he already had a pearl, another pearl, uh, which was a slightly different shape, a rather plump pearl. And so, um, it, it, was, it then went for sale in 1969, and it was sold um, for $37,000 to Richard Burton. And Richard Burton bought the pearl, of course, for Elizabeth Taylor, for her 37th birthday. And on the left you see how, how the pearl was when she received it. And there's a funny story about this, some of you may know it because it's a very famous story. But, um, the pearl was flown over to LA to be given to her, uh, and when the person got to the apartment to give it to uh, Richard Burton, Richard and Elizabeth were there, and it was 11 o'clock in the morning, and they were drinking something called Smelly Dogs. I wouldn't recommend it, I've not had one, but Smelly Dogs is actually oyster juice uh, with vodka. And so they were both rather merry. And Richard Burton gave the pearl, this great pearl, to Elizabeth Taylor. And she had it here on this uh, simple necklace. And she was jumping up and down in the bed with excitement. And after about 20 minutes, she looked down and the pearl had gone. In those days, back in the 60s, um, some of you uh, might remember that it was very fashionable to have thick pile carpets, white thick pile carpets, with, with sort of like really, really thick like this. And, uh, they, they were looking for this pearl, this white pearl amongst the white pearl carpet on, f on all fours, looking for it. And finally they realized that, that, that her dog was chewing it under the sofa. So the pearl was retrieved from the dog's mouth, and very fortunately there was no damage done to it. Um, and then Elizabeth Taylor, in her normal style, uh, glamorized it, and she made, in conjunction with Cartier, this extraordinary necklace on the right-hand side, with natural pearls, rubies, diamonds. The original pearl and the original antique leaf setting at the bottom was detachable to put back onto the cha chain. So I think for a Hollywood event, she would glamorize it with this whole rigmarole, and then for whatever, lunches, she wore it on a simple chain. Um, but in 2011, um, this pearl came to Christie's, and it was, it, it's a mesmerizing pearl. It has a wonderful shape, as you can see, an extraordinary skin, beautiful color, and a fabulous luster. There's hardly a better pearl in existence than this, of that size. Everyone fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. I didn't want anyone to buy it. I wanted to keep it in my safe forever. I spent three months going around the world giving lectures on Elizabeth Taylor and, and uh, her extraordinary uh, life and all her husband's and lots of things that happened to her. But she was an amazing mother, and, my, and from what I read, she always looked after her children. She took children with her wherever she traveled as, as much as she could. Um, and then she did something that was extraordinary, because when you have the wealth and you have the, the estate and the objects that someone like Elizabeth Taylor has, um, there's often a fight in the family when you go. Um, it's very difficult. It's not, of course, in Sharia law, um, things are very different, but in the West, you make a a, a will, and then people contest it, and members of the family contest it, and it can be terrible. So what she did, very cleverly, I would say, is that she came to Christie's, and she said, I want to sell my jewellery, and we've been, we had been doing a valuation for her over a number of years, and uh, she arranged with Christie's before she died that everything would be sold through us, and some bequests would go to 
her children, her four children. Um, and then everything we saw we went to trust fund and the money would support the children. Therefore, they had nothing to discuss after her death. And neither did we. I mean, she organized the sale, she themed it and color themed it. <coughs> she even wrote some of the, she signed some of the catalogs, which were then sold in the middle of the sale um, to raise money for charities. We saw one catalog for a quarter of a million dollars. Can you believe that? Um, and at the sale, this extraordinary pearl made $11.5 million. And at the time, that was a world record price for any single pearl. This pearl, and I want to go back and just show you the difference between this pearl and this pearl. Actually very different. When I was doing the research on the Peregrina Pearl, it was very confusing because there's the Peregrina Pearl, and there's the Peregrina Pearl, and there's the Round Peregrina Pearl, and then there's the Queen of Spain who believes she has the real Peregrina Pearl. And it's very confusing. And we uh, asked three historian researchers to look into what, what is the, 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 the history of the Peregrina Pearl. And they kind of came up with three different answers. It was a lot rather difficult. So I sort of set about doing my own research because I had been researching anyway for a number of years to try and work out which pearls were which. And I go to Spain a lot and I'm, I had some access to the, uh, the Royal Archives in Spain. And the thing with the Peregrina Pearl, the one, this one, um, is that on the base of it there's a little blemish that was, that was polished out in 1600, somewhere in the 1608. And if you look at this pearl, you can't see it from my picture, but there is the remains of a tiny blemish on the, on the base. So I knew this was the real Peregrina Pearl. So, what happened was, this pearl came in to Christie's um, uh, quite a long time ago, and we sold it, but at the time, the owner had no provenance for it. And they, it was very difficult to trace, there, was, there were no leads, and uh, all we could say in our catalogue was that this pearl was so large that, that it would have to have some raw provenance. It weighs 258 grains, and it's 30, 32 millimeters long, so it's, it's a big pearl, I don't know if you can see, but something like that size, and rather cracked on the bottom. Um, and in doing the research for the Peregrina pearl, for, for Elizabeth Taylor's pearl, I realized that actually this pearl, which is, which is a painting of Mary uh, Stuart of England, Queen of England, everyone always said, this is the Peregrina pearl, this is the Peregrina pearl, she's wearing the Peregrina pearl. And the thing was <clears throat> that once I found out that the Peregrina Pearl was found in 1576, I realized, of course, that, that Mary Tudor died in 1558. So this could not be the Peregrina Pearl. So what was this pearl? And then by looking at the shape and blowing up the painting, I realized <coughs> excuse me, that the pearl that she was wearing is the pearl that we had sold some decade or so earlier without, without knowing what the provenance was. And so it was, in fact, the Mary Tudor Pearl. And this is it here. And um, uh, it was not in the best condition. It does have, it has dried out, and pearls do dry out, and it had cracks on the bottom of it. Um, but it's an extraordinary pearl, and uh, has the most, most incredible English provenance, really. It's basically an English crown jewel. <coughs> this um, is, as you can see, Catherine the Great. <coughs> And uh, Catherine the Great had a lot of pearls. She loved her pearls, like most uh, queens and emperors. <clears throat> and after, after the, um, Ru the Russian Revolution, many of Catherine the Great's pearls were sold off, and uh, all her jewels, in fact, a lot of them were sold off and bought by Cartier. And in 19 <clears throat> 1920, uh, a wonderful pearl necklace, a long pearl necklace, actually uh, a seven euro pearl necklace, was bought by one of the Dodge brothers. Um, the Dodge family made motor cars, were engineers, and they worked for Henry Ford. And uh, Henry Ford bought them out, and in 1920 he paid 25 million dollars to buy the brothers out. So a huge amount of money. You know, so even 12 and a half million dollars each brother, a lot of money. But 
<coughs> Horace Dodge bought the necklace from Cartier um, with the provenance of, of Catherine the Great, and it had a clasp on it which had the miniature of Catherine the Great. And um, as I see, this history that Cartier had purchased a lot of Catherine the Great's sale uh, jewelry in 1918, so we believe this to be true. But he paid $825,000 for this necklace from Cartier um, in 1920, which in today's money would be roughly equivalent to $70 million. And it's a very good example because it shows you actually how undervalued pearls are today. Um, soon after that, the pearl prices crashed. Um, somewhere around probably 1929 or towards the end of the 20th decade. And that happened because of Nikimoto and the culture of pearls, we all know. It killed the market. Um, two things happened, in fact. I mean, the, the invention of the culture of pearl, which nobody could tell the difference between culture pearls and natural pearls, um, and consequently, <coughs> the gem testing laboratory of Great Britain was started in the early 1920s. And that was the first laboratory in the world uh, that actually tested pearls to give confidence to buyers and show them which were natural and which were cultured. And um, Ken, Ken Scarrett, uh, I met at that laboratory in 2000, uh, in, the, in the year, in, sorry, in 1918. And Ken first started teaching me about natural pearls in 1980. Um, so the um, uh, This is the necklace that came to Christie's. And in fact, um, it's three rows of Catherine Grace rather wonderful pearls. They're not large particularly, but very fine and beautiful luster on them. And uh, we, we sold these, uh, I'm just going to show you this picture actually before I explain more. Um, the, um, so they, they, they were bought by by um, uh, Horace Dodge for, for his wife Anna, um, and he gave them to his, he, she gave them eventually to her daughter Delphine, who's sitting here with a floppy hat, wearing some of those uh, pearls from Catherine the Great. Um, and Delphine, her fame to claim was that she was a powerboat racer, and she was the first lady to, to win the President's Cup for powerboat racing um, back in the 20s. But she sadly died in pneumonia in 1940. Or the pearls reverted back to her mother and Anna. However, the pearls then came up at auction in 2008, and they were sold in 2008 for $600,000. And then we sold them last year, uh, November last year, 2018, for $1.1 million. So it's it's a shame, isn't it, really, that, you know, that pearls have actually effectively lost so much of their value. Um, as well as the culture pearl market killing off the, the pearl market, the rise of, of, of the diamond is another important issue because up until the point where they found the Kimberley pipe in South Africa, diamonds were quite a rarity. They only really came at that time from, from Brazil and there were not so many around and they were owned by all the, ro all the royals and nobility, not the common person. And then that one pipe in South Africa produced more diamonds than all the diamonds that ever came out of the Indian Golconda mines or the Brazilian mines put together. It was an extraordinary find in Africa. Bearing in mind at one point there were lots of surveys in Africa and everyone said there are no diamonds, there never will be diamonds in South Africa. Uh, famous gemologists went there and came back and reported that there will never be diamonds found in South Africa. And then they found the Kimberley pipe. Um, but it made diamonds very popular and by then they were able to cut them extremely well and people went more for the sparkle of diamonds than the beauty and the luster of pearls. Pearls have come back a lot since then, but as I said earlier on, they were the most valuable gemstone known to man. Uh, now they're a valuable gemstone, but there are other valuable gemstones out there. Um, this is an interesting moment in Christie's history because this was a series of sales that we held between 1915 and 1918 that were called the Red Cross sales. And we were raising money, Christie's were raising money in conjunction with the Red Cross for the war effort. And towards the end of those sales, Lady um, Northcliffe,
had a very good idea, she was working with the Red Cross, she had a very good idea, that, and she asked uh, the gentry, the, the, the ladies of um, England, to take one pearl out of their necklace, just one, and send it to Christie's, in the hope that she would gather enough pearls to make one necklace. Her husband owned two newspapers, the Times and the Mail, and every time someone sent a pearl, he put a notice to, to thank that particular person. And suddenly it snowballed, and, and people from all over um, the colony sent pearls for this war effort. And finally they had thousands of pearls, enough to make actually over 40 very fine necklaces. And this is one of the things that came back to Christie's very recently, which we had the pleasure of seeing on the 100th anniversary of the sale of, this, of, this, of, the, of these pearls. Um, the 4,000 pearls that made 41 necklaces raised a total at the time of £100,000, which today would be the equivalent of about $8 million. So it's quite significant uh, fundraising effort for the war effort. For the war effort. <clears throat> this particular pearl um, came into Christie's for one of our mobile Indian jewelry sales. <coughs> And when it came in, the owner didn't know what it was. We didn't know what it was. What I knew was it was a very large pearl, and a very old pearl, not in very good condition, as you can see. And clearly there's some kind of Indian provenance with this, uh, once upon a time, probably beautifully enameled uh, top uh, and, uh, of a decoration of the pearl. The pearl weighs approximately 300 grains. Um, and I looked at it and thought, well, it could only have been owned by somebody royal. A pearl of that size would have been beautiful, it would have not been cracked, as you can see down in front, not be stained, it's the stains have happened over hundreds of years. And I started looking at this pearl, <clears throat> and I started looking at the gold work. And finally, I saw something on the edge of the gold work, under the microscope, very delicate writing. I couldn't entirely decipher it, it was, it was um, Islamic writing. <coughs> and a colleague looked at it for me. <coughs> me, and it said on their Akbar, and it gave a date of um, 1574 to 1575, which equates to the reign of Akbar between, or the life of Akbar between 1556 and 1605. So we, we felt um, that we could attribute this to, to Akbar, and it became known as the Akbar Pearl. Consequently, I mean, the estimate when it came in was about twenty to thirty thousand dollars. We raised the estimate and it made a quarter of a million dollars. And the pearl is now in the Qatar Museum, uh, one of their exhibits. Uh, not the most beautiful, but a very charming pearl actually, and it's well worth looking at. These pearls um, belonged originally to Princess Margaret. And Princess Margaret grew up as the younger daughter of the, the Duke and Duchess of York. And the, the Duke of York's brother was the king. He was King Edward III, who famously abdicated to marry the American heiress Wallace Simpson. Thus changing the royal lineage in England forevermore. And his younger brother became King George VI. And uh, Queen... Um, and, um, Princess Margaret's elder sister is, of course, now the Queen of England. Um, this pearl necklace, wonderful pearl necklace, was given to her by her grandmother, um, Queen Mary, as a present for her 18th birthday. Now, when Princess Margaret died, um, her jewels came to Christie's for sale. Her mother, um, the Queen Mother, and the Queen all have similar necklaces. And I had a funny experience when I, when I first started at Christie's back in 1980. The jewelry department was on the top floor. All our clients came in, we all saw them on the ground floor um, in viewing rooms. And we had a constant stream of clients coming in. And I was forever running up and running down, running up and running down. And our lift was notoriously bad and quite often broke down. It always broke down in the summer. And one summer, I'm running up the stairs, two by two, jewels in my pocket, going to look at them upstairs in good daylight, or under the microscope, and run back down again. And I come tearing up the stairs, two by two, and almost bumped into a lady and nearly knock her over. And I look up, and it's the Queen Mother um, coming down the stairs from our boardroom. 
with our chairman and managing director and other dignitaries. And so I kind of dusted myself there and looked up and um, I was introduced to the Queen Mother. But the important point of this story is that I was absolutely eye level with her pearl necklace and transfixed by her pearl necklace, not so much by the Queen Mother. <laughs> and I, I, I consigned her pearl necklace to memory. And strangely enough, a couple of years later, I did exactly the same thing, running up the stairs, bumped into her, and the lift was broken. It happened twice. So I eventually got invited to some of these lunches with the Queen Mother because uh, I was dealing with noble jewellery a little later in my career, and she loved noble jewellery, so she always asked for me. She couldn't remember my name, but she would say, could the dear me Scott come and tell me about the jewels? And I always think that's quite amusing because she's actually Scottish and I'm actually bigger than she was. But um, she's a wonderful lady and it was a great sort of moment to be able to sit with her and talk about pearls and jewels. Um, and the sale of Princess Margaret's jewellery, um, when it came into us, we had um, not very long to catalogue. Some of the pieces had Labels inside that said exactly what, where the provenance was, but many of them didn't. And strangely enough, the family were not really able to help us. Um, I suppose if you don't sometimes think about your own provenance, you just sort of get on with life. But we did find one person who knew all the answers, more or less, and that was the butler. Because Princess Margaret's butler would come down and say, yes, ma'am, and Princess Margaret would say, could you bring me uh, Queen Mary's pearl necklace? Or could you bring me... Um, you know, she would say whose it was and where it came from. He lived in Australia, we had to get him over to, to England very quickly, put him in a chair, a spotlight on his face and drill him. And get as much information out of him as we could, but it was very helpful in terms of getting the provenance for the sale. Um, but this, this necklace um, uh, was one of the star lots for the sale, and it sold for about three quarters of a million dollars. Um, and it, was, was, it went east. I can't say exactly where it went, but it didn't stay in Europe. It was bought by a collector from the East. <clears throat> this pearl, um, well, the one I'm talking about now is called La Regente pearl. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of it, and it's not necessarily any of these ones here, but the, the La Regente pearl weighed up 302 grains, and it was probably the largest, finest drop shape pearl recorded. It was bought in 1811 for $8,000 8, $8, by Empress Mary Louise of Italy and was in her collection, Empress on the left here. Um, she was also Empress of the French and when she died it passed to Empress Eugenie. Um, and then around 1887, during the, second, the, 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 the time of, of the French Revolution, um, Christie's were asked to hold a sale of the French crown jewels. Actually, earlier than that, 1872, they were asked to hold an auction of French crown jewels. Um, but there were other auctions, there was another one later, um, which was held at, at the Louvre itself. And at that time, this, this extraordinary pearl, let me show you here, <clears throat> was bought by Carl Fabergé. Um, the, Huge corsage on the left, and I think um, Andrew's going to say something about it. So I think I'll just let him talk about that and not steal his thunder. Uh, but this was La Regente Pearl here that you see on the right. And an extraordinary pearl. It was sold by Karl Fabergé to Princess Tatiana Yusupov of, of Russia. She had it for a number of years, but then come the revolution, um, she fled Moscow, and the pearl was found by the Bolsheviks in, in the safe in a Moscow apartment. So we've sold this pearl in 1988 um, in Christie's in Geneva and made $859,000. And then we sold it again, luckily, in 2005, and it made $2.5 million. On both occasions, those were our world record prices for a pearl. Um, this is Tatiana Yusupov. And all of these ladies you can see adore their pearls. Now this is an extraordinary pearl actually, it's one of my, one of my favourites that I've had the great opportunity of handling. <clears throat> it's a natural black pearl necklace, three rows as you see, very large pearls. The largest from memory I think is about 15-16 millimetres. And they're black, 
they're jet black. There are not many black pearl necklaces in the world. Christie's have sold almost all of them. I mean, all of, all, almost all of the ones that have come to auction have come through Christie's, I should put it that way. But we've only really sold about three that you would say were properly black. And the majority of the other ones were all like in silvery grey. When you get a black pearl necklace like this, um, it's an incredible sight because there's always an undertone, there are always undertone shades amongst, amongst it with, with every pearl. Undertones of purplish, of green, of brown, of orange. And when you see a black pearl necklace with all those beautiful undertones together, it's a, it's a joy. I mean, it brings tears to your eyes. This pearl necklace um, was uh, owned by Empress Eugenie in the 19th century. And in fact, she made black pearl necklaces popular. Um, popular, I say, but there were not so many to be, to be worn. But uh, prior to that, nobody wanted black pearls. They always wanted white pearls. That was always thought to be best. And then Empress Eugenie owned this necklace, um, and she made people sit up and, and, and sort of pay more attention to black pearl necklaces. We sold this in 1872 at the French Crown Jewel sale for $20,000. It was then later owned by uh, this model, Nina Dyer, um, who first of all married Baron Hans Heinrich von, von Tyson, and then second, her second marriage was Prince Sudrin Aga Khan in 1957. Um, you see her here on, on the left, actually wearing two rows of the three row necklace. And she sadly died at an early age. She died at age 35. Um, and we sold this necklace in Geneva in 1969 for $134,000. It then came back to Christie's in 1997 and we sold it for $913,000. I wondered today what it would fetch. You know, obviously there's a huge difference <coughs> in values between 1997 and today. I would, I would hazard a guess that this would probably fetch at least 15 to 20 million dollars. And it would be one of the most valuable pearl necklaces in the world. Thank you for listening to my stories of pearls. Um, there are many pearls I didn't put into my talk that Chris has sold, um, but I just chose 11 that I thought I thought would interest you. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, please ask. Uh, is that a question at the back? No, but don't worry, that's great because I'm probably running a little bit late. Oh, it's tough. Please do. Um, when, when a pearl gets, when you say that usually you're wearing two strands instead of three, does that mean that you undo the necklace completely and we, we do it, basically? Um, how does that completely change the original? Like, for instance, here, how, she, how would she do that? So it becomes a brand new necklace. Um, yeah, I think you know, that, that these things change and clasps change and people who own them do different things with them. And it makes a lot of sense if you, if you actually have three clasps and you can wear whatever combination you wish. Um, and a lot of people will do that. In this particular picture here, it would seem that this was just simply one clasp and you wear it as three, three, three rows. Uh, but um, here... So transformable Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, earlier on in my talk, there was the Catherine the Great necklace and that was, we were presenting that as, as, as two, two necklaces Although it came from one originally, it had two clasps. And we saw the black pearl, the other, the other black pearl necklace that could be sort of uh, not quite equal to this, but was properly black, um, came from an Indian princess. Uh, and it, 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 was, it was two rows of black pearls and they were both two separate strands of separate clasps. Any other questions? Catherine. I'm just asking, if the jewel is modified, does it change the value? Um, it depends what the modification is, and it depends what the jewel is, but probably yes. Um, most collectors like to have things in original condition, and they should be in original condition. I think some things that are very old will get changed, and if it's an important jewel, you can forgive it a little bit of some alterations. But it, it, it's case by case, very much case by case. Some alterations might render the jewel worthless. Um, 
it's a not, there's no straight, there's no easy answer to that question. And presenting with something, and I can say to you whether that, the way it's been altered, has an impact on the value or not. And do you see the that the jewelry, the historical jewelry, is like the Oh yes, yes indeed. You know, over generations and over hundreds of years, things have changed a lot. Um, they change with fashion. They change with someone's uh, lifestyle. Uh, look at Elizabeth Taylor. You know, her lifestyle was this huge, glamorous necklace, but she did it in such a way that she still maintained the, the integrity of the original piece, and that's important. I think if you make changes to a historic piece or just an old piece, if you can do it in such a way that you maintain the integrity and it can go back to its original form, well, there's no harm done. So you don't go and lose the original elements, which sadly I've sometimes seen in the past. Thank you. Uh, I, thank you. Yes, um, you mentioned that uh, pearls tend to dry out by time. Is there a way to prevent that or to prevent the cracks that we saw in some of the pearls to stay? There is. If you, if you put a glass of water, a small glass of water, in the safe or, or, or where, where, wherever the pearls are kept, that will certainly help. Um, the traditional way of, of keeping pearls, as I'm sure many of you know, is in the red silk. Uh, that, that is a far better way of keeping pearls. So if you keep them in red silk, and if in your safe you put a little, little glass of water, that's, that's great. The worst thing you can do, and I've seen people do this often, thinking it will help and protect the pearls, the worst thing you can do is put them into cotton wool. And cotton wool will draw out any moisture that's in the, model, in the pearl. And as they are uh, living organisms, they do actually have some moisture in them. And that's why they crack. The, the loss, loss of moisture will, will crack the pearl. So <coughs> never, never, never wrap your pearls in cotton wool. It's the worst thing you can do. And be careful of things like hairspray. Take them off. Do this. And scent. Um, yeah, they're quite robust and they will last a long time, but one should just remember those things. Any other questions before I hand over to Andrew? Well, thank you again very much. Um, I'd like to introduce Andrew, Andrew Prince. And Andrew is uh, a wonderful researcher and uh, I think he's going to show you some great images. Uh, some fascinating things. And Andrew has created jewels for lots of, of uh, television programs and film productions, most, most notably Downton Abbey, which I'm sure you all watched. Uh, glued to, um, oh, Andrew created all of those jewels. So Andrew, I give the floor to you and thank you very much.